I just set it up. I think that looks pretty nice there. I don't think it's too intrusive. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's trying to straighten it. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to get this out. Oh. How can you get to tell? Yeah, that one should have sent, and then I can send out more. Okay. Yeah, based on that one. That looks great. Alright. Um, I could sit kind of around here. Yeah, I can like, you can come back and forth or something. Yeah. Yeah, I can pretty much see it though. Yeah. I think we're okay, yeah. You can just sit out there because I know we need to go there. No, like I know you'll have to be up and like on the other side, so it should be fun. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. from the other room. Next up is um, uh, our next session. We have two more sessions, three more sessions, and then drinks. Um, we have, um, uh, up, um, I'll let uh, Andrea Peterson, she's a technology reporter for the Washington Post, introduce our next guest, um, Travis LeBlanc from the Federal Communications Commission. I'll let Andrea um, introduce him. But um, Andrea is with the Washington Post and um, with the Switch, um, which I enjoy tremendously. So I think we're going to go ahead and do our sit down next. We all good to go here? Perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me here, guys. Uh, but I'm actually not the interesting part. The interesting part here is Travis LeBlanc, who is the, the uh, chief of, of the Enforcement Bureau over at, at the Federal Communications Commission. Travis, thanks for coming on board. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here again. I think the last time I was here was in 2013. And uh, at that time, I was speaking on behalf of California but I am now in D.C. at the FCC. And actually, let's start off with talking a little bit about the differences between doing enforcement stuff at the state level versus your role now over at the FCC. I know you're really active on data security and privacy stuff in California. Uh, how does that sort of inform what you're doing now? Sure. That's, um, California is uh, the largest country in, I mean, it's the largest state in the country. <laughs> it is its own country, ninth largest economy in the world. I used to have those talking points down and they used to just roll right off. But it has some of the strong about being in California was we've worked on so many different kinds of cases. Uh, at the state level in an attorney general's office, the mandate of the attorney general is really broad to protect consumers at the end of the day, and really to represent the people of the great state of California. And I've tried to bring a lot of that spirit with me to the FCC, where uh, I run the Enforcement Bureau, which is the FCC's largest bureau. We have 24 field offices around the country, and we essentially enforce all nations act as well as the FCC's rules and regulations. Um, and what we've tried to do over the last year since I've been at the Enforcement Bureau is to focus on the kinds of cases and issues that matter most to Americans in the 21st century. And uh, that has meant that we need to be, we have to be quick, uh, we have to be smart about our enforcement, we have to be creative and nimble, um, and we have to partner with law enforcement quite a bit. Uh, in every case that we do at the FCC, um, I really force the team to ask ourselves four key questions. How in this case are we protecting consumers? How are we safeguarding competition? How are we securing networks? And how are we protecting or policing the integrity of the programs and funds that are administered by uh, the FCC? And it's important for us not just to focus on technical rule violations, but actually to go one step beyond that and begin to understand how the work that we're doing impacts the average consumer today. As, as someone that comes from a law enforcement background, uh, I personally have only worked in government agencies that do law enforcement. 
This is the first time I've ever worked in a regulatory agency, and it's been a bit of a different experience. On the law enforcement side, uh, we we don't we, we kind of we, we look at the, the 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 laws that we have to work with. We interpret them in light of the facts, and we ultimately uh, look to a court to help resolve them, depending upon how the law is applied uh, to the facts. Well, in a regulatory agency, I actually have the benefit of going down the hall to speak to the folks that wrote the rule that we're trying to enforce. We have the ability on the front end to actually work with them as they're drafting rules and regulations so that we can provide them our feedback on what we're seeing. And we also have the ability after an investigation to go back to that same rulemaking bureau and to say, hey, here's a gap that we found in our investigation. We think that this would be good for you to address in a future rulemaking. And that's a different role than you see at the state in an attorney general's office or even at a Department of Justice at the, at the federal level. For me, as coming with a background in law enforcement, um, there, I, I think there's a few things that distinguish me um, in my approach to enforcement at the FCC. Uh, the first thing is a focus on prevention and not just on responding after the fact. That is, you know, we, we can borrow, I think, a lot of um, good knowledge and counsel from the public health model where uh, they focus more on prevention than responding when there's a catastrophic uh, health problem at the end of the day. I think we too can do the same thing on the enforcement side by trying to provide the industry with guidance to help prevent the industry from ultimately taking action that we think crosses the legal line. I think the second thing that uh, distinguishes me is a, is, is a focus on victims and really thinking about consumers. And I think the law enforcement background that I have helps with that focus on consumer protection. Um, and then thirdly, it's a, 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 an understanding that it's important for us to partner with law enforcement. Uh, there, you, you, you probably cannot have too many cops on the beat um, these days. Uh, and, and what we realize is that in the world that we're in, it's important that we use our scarce uh, resources and that we're leveraging those with other government agencies that also have scarce resources. So it's been fun getting to work at the FCC. We're doing a lot of what I think is interesting work and we've taken some new approaches over the last year. Speaking of new approaches, you guys have really, well I don't need to tell people in the room here that you guys have been very busy over the past year or so, uh, especially leaning into some other areas that are perhaps not as traditional that you thought of as FCC enforcement, for instance, privacy enforcement and data security. Uh, what can you tell me about how you guys decided to approach the recent AT&T action? Uh, sure, we have been very focused, as I said, on protecting consumers on the issues that matter most to Americans in the 21st century. And that meant doing some new kinds of cases um, and also re-energizing our um, activities in certain areas like privacy and data security where the FCC for years has had great long-standing rules on the books as well as there are great privacy protections in the Communications Act. You know, we, there are data breach notifications that are already required uh, by the FCC's rules. We have uh, really strong protections in the cable and satellite space that require cable and satellite operators to not only protect PII, but to take, and I quote, take all necessary steps to protect it. That's a very strong protection that we have in place. And on CPNI, um, in, in the telecom space, right, we, we have rules that prevent um, carriers from using CPNI without the consent, from a, using CPNI without the consent of their uh, of consumers, and also you know requiring them to report it to uh, law enforcement. Uh, as you mentioned, we recently took a, um, a, a significant action against AT&T in connection with data breaches in uh, three countries, Mexico, Colombia, and the Philippines that all affected Americans. This is part of a broader set of uh, enforcement activities that we've done around privacy and data security over the last, uh, last year. I think we've done almost uh, $50 million or so. Um, in actions uh, in about a year. Um, 25 million is what we did uh, in the AT&T case. And I think, I actually think that one day that case will be taught in law schools. 
because there is so much ongoing uh, with that case. So there with AT&T, we had a case where three personnel at a call center in Mexico were being paid by a third party to provide the names and the last four of the social security numbers of AT&T customers where when they were given, the third party would give them a list of a bunch of phone numbers of AT&T customers and they would then go into the database and pull out, retrieve the information. Well, the third party in that case was actually named El Pelon. El Pelon uh, is a moniker, I think, for, um, uh, it actually means in Spanish, it's like, you know, bald-headed Hispanic male. Um, and if you don't believe me, it's on urbandictionary.com. You can look it up and you'll see it um, there. Um, El, over the course of five months, uh, AT &T, the personnel at that call center um, obtained AT&T employees. That's about 11,000 per month. One has to begin to question whether they were actually taking customer service calls during those months or whether they were just roving through you know, the, the databases looking for this information. Um, LP Loan would then receive the social security numbers, last four, the names and the phone numbers, and he would then go to AT&T's website he would input that information in to obtain unlock codes for AT&T phones. So you might have to ask, why does El Pelon have so many phones that he needs this information? Clearly, the owners could have given them their social security number if, if, if they were authorized phones. And our best information that you know starts off with uh, three people in Mexico. But as we started to dig further, we learned, and this is in the settlement order, that AT&T had become aware that two, that other employees at this call center had done the same thing a couple years earlier. And as we dug further, we learned that its call center in Colombia, they had the same problem going on there. They had fired personnel who were providing, this, providing information to third parties, and then the managers there started to get involved in it. And then we dug further and we found out that in the Philippines, there were you know, a number of other employees of call centers over there doing, and you begin to see a pattern actually across them that begins to be problematic. And it raises serious concerns about, you know, for any company, about vendors, thinking about vendors and making sure that, that they understand the privacy and data security requirements um, that attach to data collected, personal data collected uh, in the United States. But it also shows the necessity for partnering with law enforcement abroad. There you had a case where we had the breaches were occurring in three separate countries. We did another case in October against Terracom and Yortel for $10 million where they placed the names, phone, the names, addresses, driver's license, social security numbers of 305,000 people on the internet with no encryption. And you know how did that happen? It happened because they used a vendor in India that ended up doing this. So suddenly we've done two major data security cases in the last six months or so that involve massive breaches around the world and it's necessitated for us a need to begin to partner with them. So we've joined the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, which is a collaboration of uh, data protection authorities around the world. And last week, we also joined the Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities um, to further our, uh, our, our efforts to work and partner with uh, not only uh, our, our state and local and federal partners, but also our international partners. So I really appreciate you brought up CP&I in your last answer there. How I think there's kind of an elephant in the room here about how does reclassification in or internet and a mobile broadband provider first change the kinds of protections consumers are going to have for CP&I? Yeah. So uh, the uh, commission uh, a couple months ago adopted strong uh, rules to protect a free and open internet. Uh, those rules, generally speaking. Um, prohibit uh, broadband internet access services from engaging in throttling, uh, blocking, paid prioritization, and other harms to uh, the innovation and, of an open and, and free internet. Um, those rules are based upon solid legal uh, grounding, uh, and although it uh, reclassifies uh, broadband internet access services as um, carriers, common carriers under Title II, the Commission for, forbear from, provide, from applying all of the uh, provisions of Title II. However, uh, the Commission did not forbear from Section 222 of uh, the Communications Act. It did forbear from the FCC's rules implementing uh, Section 222 with, uh, with respect to, um, to uh, telecommunications services, but not uh, the, not the statutory provisions. Um, the commission next week is going to hold a workshop, which I encourage 
uh, folks here to attend to look at what rules should be put in place to protect privacy and data security um, in the broadband internet space. Um, as of right now, though, uh, Section 222, as the statutory provision, actually does apply, and that generally means um, two things, uh, broadly speaking. Um, first, um, it means that uh, broadband internet access service providers pursuant to uh, subsection A of 222 are required to protect the confidentiality of customer proprietary information. Uh, the commission uh, in uh, the Terracom case that I just mentioned a little while ago, the breach in India uh, involving an Indian vendor, as well as in the commission's open internet order, made it clear that uh, proprietary information within the meaning of Section 222 is broader um, than CPNI. Um, it includes, you know, generally speaking, the concept of personally identifiable information that we, or personal information that's um, used uh, broadly in the privacy and data security um, conversation generally. Uh, the second provision that applies under Section 222 uh, it, that's, you know, related to CPNI in particular is, uh, uh, is that the CPNI requirements, and CPNI is defined um, within uh, Section 222, generally it means call history information, things like duration, location uh, of a call, uh, and that those, uh, those uh, statutory provisions will go into effect, um, and of course we'll wait to see whether, the, uh, whether and when uh, and what the Commission adopts or rules to apply specifically 222 to implement it um, in the broadband internet. So I think that also brings us back to this idea about oh, uh, the FCC has a regulatory agency where they who are making well not you but the commission is making in rule rules that go beyond and uh, doing case by case enforcement. Can you talk about oh, how that seems to play into the deterrence culture that you were speaking about earlier? Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, um, I like to view enforcement as a spectrum. Um, and on the front end of the spectrum in a regulatory agency is the rulemaking side, right? That's where we host workshops, we do notice and comment before we adopt a rule to learn from the industry uh, about the practices that are ongoing, to learn what folks in the community, what stakeholders think ought to be permitted and what shouldn't be permitted. And that moves then towards an actual rulemaking. And when you get the actual rule, we are making clear to uh, to, to the external world what the Commission thinks is appropriate and should be done and shouldn't be done. Sometimes that's not sufficient guidance. But, but that rulemaking itself and the rule should help prevent a lot of companies from doing something to cross the line. Well, beyond that, though, we still give further guidance. Um, we put out enforcement advisories on a regular basis to provide the industry with guidance about how we are interpreting the rule or the statute to help, again, prevent the industry from, uh, from, from misstepping or running afoul of the law. In the open internet context, the commission has given us a new tool to, to focus on prevention, which is uh, advisory opinions. Uh, the the, the uh, businesses uh, that are, are regulated by us will have the ability to submit questions to us um, a, about a potential business plan or business activity that they may be engaged in, and we have the discretion to provide them with an advisory opinion upon how we would um, how we would conduct that they're engaging in. Again, this all focuses on prevention to help companies from going afoul. Now we do, you know, when it happens and when a company crosses the line, we do have to be responsive and we do have to use those hammers that are traditional tools of enforcement, right? Uh, hammers such as fines or, um, or uh, settlements. Uh, that, that are imposed, you know, in, in FCC speak, we say notices of apparent liability or forfeiture orders uh, being imposed, and that's necessary. But even when we do settlements, we now in the FCC try to make clear what we thought was the conduct that was offensive. Uh, we try to make clear the compliance regime that we believe they ought to take in place to help prevent this from happening again in the future. That is to both provide guidance to others in the industry who are acting, but it's also to help that particular company uh, avoid uh, the same kinds of problems in the future. So we have a long uh, arc there that we work with to try to, um, to really try to get to a world where everyone is in compliance, and that's our goal. And, and if we, ideally we want to get there through prevention, but when we can't, 
uh, we will respond and we will uh, use um, uh, the tools that are available uh, to us to ensure that the, the Communications Act and the rules and regulations of the FCC are being complied with. And so one of the points that I hear from a lot of folks when we're talking about uh, regulations, particularly in tech and the mobile broadband and uh, the internet general space is that things are moving so quickly, how do you keep up? So that's my question, how do you keep up? Oh. <laughs> that, is a ch that is a real challenge. Um, it's something that I've been dealing with you know, for many years. Um, in California, we dealt with it quite often. The, the issue, as I see it, is that the pace of innovation in the industry has outpaced uh, the, uh, the regulatory process. Um, if you think about the amount of time that it takes for a Congress to identify an issue in need of a law, to then draft legislation, to put it through however many committees, to pass one chamber of Congress, to then turn it over to the other chamber, uh, the other house to deal with, to then start in committees, work through their pro uh, a rules con a, a conference committee to come together to actually you know uh, resolve out any differences, then the president to sign it into law, then the then it to go into effect for a regulatory agency to begin the regulatory process to actually do notice and comment and get to a rulemaking, then for the rules to go into effect, then for us in enforcement to conduct an investigation, which then may be challenged in court, and then to start the whole court process. You're talking about a five to seven year process. During that whole time, the industry and the innovation has moved way beyond it. You know, at this point, I think the iPhone, the iPhone, the first real smartphone as we know it today, is only eight years old, right? I just told you about a five to seven year process. For us to get through this whole thing takes a long time. It's incumbent upon us to be faster, to, to ensure that we're being creative, stifling innovation in ways that no one anticipated at the time that they actually did the rulemaking. And we've been working really hard at the FCC to speed up our processes. So the AT&T case that I just told you about, that data breach case, those breaches happened in 2014. We took action in 2015, early 2015. We're trying to move quicker so that the actions that we're taking are responsive to the issues that are affecting consumers uh, today, and we're also trying to ensure that we're, we can provide guidance on the front end, we're doing it, because that's important uh, to ensuring that we're being relevant to the issues that matter to people today. So I feel older just having listened to you explain the whole regulatory <laughs> process, and I've been able to monopolize a lot of your time here, but I'm sure I'm not the only one with questions. Does anybody have something for Travis? I don't know if you have a mic or not. Oh, sure. <laughs> I think Tim here is going to help us out with that. Thanks, Travis. Yeah. I wanted to ask about zero rating services and sponsored data. I know that in the open internet order, it said that the FCC would be looking at these on a case by case basis. Um, how do you envision the Enforcement Bureau um, looking at these cases. Um, do we want to not end up with another Metro PCS situation where a small competitor is penalized for trying to give something away for free to try to gain an edge on its larger competitors? I mean, th these arrangements don't just benefit those who can afford them. Some of them benefit small companies who are trying to get an edge. And how can you ensure that the FCC won't be stifling these arrangements and throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Well, as you just highlighted in your question, um, there are a number of challenges to dealing with that issue or, frankly, to dealing with lots of the issues um, that come up in the open internet context. Um, the rules uh, that the FCC adopted are scheduled to go into effect, I think it's on June 12th, um, and there are a number of ways any particular case, whether it could come before uh, the Enforcement Bureau. Uh, it could come before us in an advisory opinion. Uh, it could come before us in the context of a formal complaint where two, uh, two businesses uh, want to essentially uh, litigate against each other with the uh, enforcement bureau uh, on delegated authority from the commission ultimately um, deciding um, uh, the issue or it could come to us in the case of a proactive enforcement action um, taken by an investigation taken by the enforcement bureau. Uh, each one of those will require us to develop facts will require us to understand the, 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 the conduct that is um, being, uh, th that is, is, is taking place and to evaluate it in light of the circumstances of the industry at that time. It's hard to predict right now uh, any particular result, 
uh, but we will um, use whatever uh, authorities and tools the Commission has made available uh, to us to ensure that, uh, that Americans have access to a free and open internet. All right, looks like we got another one back here. Mm -hmm. We've conveniently figured out the microphone situation. Thank you for all your help. Uh, thank you. One of the uh, most, at least as far as I'm concerned, promising developments uh, of late is that the uh, Commission is uh, uh, making uh, parties to consent decrees admit uh, uh, viability rather than, uh, uh, say, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, do you find that that makes it more difficult to negotiate the consent decree when you require them to, to admit to violation? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, so we've made a number of changes to consent decrees to our settlement documents at the FCC over the last year. Um, one of those changes that we've made is to, in, uh, to begin to seek uh, admissions of liability where we think those are appropriate. Um, this is something that's happening at more than just the FCC. It's part of a broader conversation that probably began in 2011 um, in the Southern District of New York when I think it was Judge Kaplan rejected a settlement from the SEC uh, because, uh, in connection with financial collapse, uh, because uh, it didn't contain any um, uh, admissions um, in it. The FTC has also seen this in litigation. And we began to look at it and begin to say, hey, in, in key cases, uh, we need to seek um, admissions. And we begin pushing for them to ensure accountability. It's very important that in settlements, where major egregious violations have taken place, that companies be held to account for uh, the conduct that they engaged in. Now, we've been very, um, we, we've offered a diverse, diverse series of, of ways of approaching um, admissions, right? In the, uh, and we've done everything from the, uh, like the AT&T data breach, where it was a do not contest, as opposed to an express denial, um, is what we had there, to ones where we've, you know, we've literally said, you know, there are admissions that are at stake. That is one set of changes that is part of a broader set of changes. Um, we have uh, standardized our consent decrees and the templates. We have increased and improved the background section in them to make sure that when you read a consent decree from the FCC, you know what we think was the conduct that was wrong in it. We've added it to our adopting orders um, as well. We've also changed the payments that are made to the FCC from calling them voluntary contributions, which is what they called them, um, uh, what I can understand is it was used to give companies a tax deduction. Um, we, we've changed that to civil penalties, non-tax deductible. Um, uh, to ensure that there's, again, accountability there. So we're thinking comprehensively about our settlement posture. I can tell you that we have not seen a noticeable decrease. Um, in fact, we haven't seen a decrease in the number of settlements that we've been doing um, at the FCC. And even in terms of the monetary value, uh, they've been substantially more with us focusing not just on fines, but also on restitution of victims. Beginning to think that when we're dealing with large uh, fraud to consumers. You know, two examples that come to mind immediately are settlements that we did along with the FTC and 50 state AGs as well as the AG of DC last year on cramming unauthorized third party charges to um, sell, in that case it was uh, cell phone bills. And uh, the AT&T case that we did was $105 million. Um, and uh, the T-Mobile case was uh, around $90 million. In the AT&T case, about 80 million of that went to restitution. That went back to victims. It wasn't just about ensuring that we were increasing our fines and uh, increasing the amount that goes back to the treasury, but it was about making victims whole. And we're really, you know, we're really thinking about that in our settlements um, as well, we're beginning to think about how we can make consumers whole at the end of the day. All right, I think we're running out of our clock, so I can do one more question if we have one, and it looks like we do. Uh, that young lady back there. Hi, Katie from Communications Daily. Just wondering what your reaction is to those who say that privacy and data security should be left for the FTC to handle. Yeah, it's, um, I certainly have heard that. Um, uh, the, F <laughs> the, the FCC has long had strong uh, <coughs> privacy protections um, in place in our regulations as well as 
in the Communications Act. Um, as the nation's expert uh, communications regulatory agency, we understand uh, the sensitivity um, of personal information that is collected by uh, communications, and the industry has largely um, adapted to those provisions that are in place. Um, you, you know, when it comes to privacy and data security, when you look at the number of breaches, for example, just breaches that are happening, you realize that you really can't have enough cops on the beat um, when it comes to these kinds of issues. We have worked uh, long with the FTC uh, on a number of issues. I mentioned the AT&T and T-Mobile settlements that we did.